Christ is risen. We watch this Jeremiah mired down in mud, in cistern, in fear and hostility all around him, finally extricated by watching friends who have done your work. We watch this Jesus set deep in the grip of death, but not held, held overnight, but not held, held two nights, but not held, because the power of death could not hold him. We know ourselves to be held overnight for two nights, too long, held by fear and anxiety, held by grudge and resentment, held by doubt and fatigue, held by too much stuff, by all manner of the forces of death. Held powerless, but turned toward you. You and your risenness make Sundays even for us, even among us, even here, even now. The centering prayer in prayer for forgiveness comes from fragments of prayers taken from the islands of Scotland in the late 1800s at a time when uh, households did not have the privilege of clergy because of the remote distance. And these prayers emerged out of family homes and we use them now as part of our own homes in this time of worship. Let us pray. 
Thanks be to you, O God, that we have risen this day. We thank you for to the rising of life itself. Be the purpose of God between us and each purpose, the hand of God between us and each hand, the pain of Christ between us and each pain, the love of Christ between us and each love. O God, who brought us into the bright light of this new day, bring us to the guiding light of eternity. God of life, do not darken your light to us. God of life, do not limit your joy in us. God of life, do not shut your door on us. God of life, do not refuse us your mercy. O oh God of life, eternity cannot hold you, nor can our little words catch the magnificence of your kindness. Yet in the space of our small hearts and in silence, you can come close and repair us. And so we invite you now into this time of silence and this prayer asking for forgiveness. O oh God of life, grant us your forgiveness for our careless thoughts, for our thoughtless deeds, for our empty speech and the words which we wounded. O oh God of life, grant us your forgiveness for our false desires, for our hateful actions, for our wastefulness, and for all we have left untended. O oh loving Christ, hanged on a tree, yet risen in the morning, scatter the sin from our souls as the mist from the hills. Begin what we do, inform what we say, redeem, redeem who we are. For in you we place our hope, our great hope, our living hope, this day and evermore. And we sing, Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy, have mercy on us. And so I say, friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Lindsay, and it is time for our time with children. And this morning, I thought I would speak to all children because we are all children of God, whether we are young or young at heart. Today is Mother's Day, and on this day, we take time to celebrate all the mothers in our lives, both those who raised us in our homes and those strong women in our lives who have helped shape and mold who we are today. We can probably all think of women in our early lives. Those of you who are little ones now, think about all the ladies at church who might help you tie your shoe, or the teachers that when you fall and scrape your knee on the playground, get you a Band-Aid and help pick you up and dust you off. And then as we grow in our lives, we meet wonderful women who help us grow in faith and courage, who teach us hope and love. I want you to stop and think of all the wonderful women who have been mothers to you in your life and give thanks to God for their presence. I had the wonderful opportunity this week to spend some time with some of the mothers of young children in our church through some front porch conversations and to take some pictures of them with their children and families. And what a wonder this was to my soul to see this kind of love lived out in front of me. You see, we are all Christ's hands and feet and hearts in this world. And what a wonderful job the moms in our lives are doing. Today's scripture that we are talking about is Psalm 31 verses 1 through 5. And before I read it, I, I wanted to share with you some of my thoughts on this Mother's Day about this particular reading. Psalm 31 talks about turning to God as our refuge and our fortress in our lives. And don't we all need that right now? But I was struck reading this as to how all the mothers and the mother figures in our lives serve as Christ's hands and feet and hearts in our lives, providing refuge and a fortress for us at all different stages of our lives. So as I read it, I would love for you to um, take some time to enjoy some of the pictures that I was able to take this week of some of the wonderful women in our church and also to see the families and the children and their smiles. And I hope that it brings you some joy today and that I hope that you take time today to thank all the women who have been like mothers in your lives on this special day. Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Our New Testament lesson is from John 14, 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, 
so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Well, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. For very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. In my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This day is a wonderful uh, and yet a complicated day, Mother's Day. It's a day that's joyful for so many. It is complicated um, because we're going to be celebrating it in different ways this year than we have in years past. Uh, it's a joyful day. Oh, those pictures of the kids with their moms, just wonderful. But it's a complicated day because for many, uh, it is a day where people are uh, reminded of what they are not. Uh, earlier this week, I interviewed Crystal Ribble, a delightful uh, person who wrote a book called The Church's Orphans, How the Church Can Protect Couples Longing for Parenthood. And so she's a mom. Uh, I did a Zoom conference call uh, with her and recorded it. I put it at the very end of today's service. and. Uh, uh, and so she has write about those couples and individuals who we have accidentally marginalized, women for whom it has not been part of their experience to physically produce a child, uh, and also uh, couples who um, uh, would long to have children but they can't because of infertility issues. I, I recorded it as part of our tables of content where I'm talking to people um, about matters of faith and practice, and again, it's at the very end of the service. Um, so it's a complicated day, as you will hear some of what she talks about. Um, the text from John, John 14, 1 through 14, it is a beautiful text. Uh, it's a text that we read oftentimes at funerals um, of loved ones who have died, but it is a complicated text as well, just like the day is. Uh, it is one of the most um, beautiful yet divisive passages in Scripture. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Uh, and if Jesus would have stopped there, there wouldn't be much trouble. But then the next line is the kicker as he goes on to say, no one comes to the Father except through me. And throughout history, zealous believers um, have used this line to draw deep lines in the sand of division, that either you're with us or you are against us. It's Jesus' way or no way. Follow Jesus and you'll find God. All other paths lead straight to hell. Um, and so I'm not going to really, that's not my focus, is to talk about this text today, but I figure that for some of you all, it's going to trip you all up and you can't get past to where I want to take you without me first addressing this. Because uh, the passage troubles me because we have used it as a time for to accentuate the divisiveness in our nation, in our church, in our world. And again, and it's not my focus, um, but what um, I, I know about this text and uh, what I want to kind of talk about is is I think the impasse that many of you all find is to think of what Jesus said and imagine, if you will, uh, a herd of sheep that are collected together and placed within a fence. We might call that a bounded set of who is in and who is out. Sheep are in the fold. And if you're not in that gate, you're out of it. Now imagine differently that same herd of sheep, uh, but they're not bound by a fence, but they are following a shepherd. At its best, what Christianity is, when it's at its best, is this is what we might call a centered set, not a bound set, uh, centered on God through Christ. And so for me, when I ask what are the needs of the, the world, 
um, and uh, that the church should be focused upon right now. I come not to a decision that it has to be about right belief um, of who's in and who's out. Rather, it is instead peace and love and justice. And if it's peace and love and justice, then how do we achieve that when we put up fences with our ritual practices of centering ourselves um, uh, on, on right belief rather than centering ourselves around peace and love and justice. But anyway, again, it's not my focus to talk about this portion of the passage, but rather the very first line that I think you all are resonating with this day. Do not let your hearts be troubled. It's kind of like that line from Jerry Maguire, you had me at a low. Because <laughs> I think that's where you, some of you all are resonating right now. Uh, you have sort of heavy hearts. Um, you felt it. Uh, and we wanted to say it to our children in this time. And one of my sons re re reminded me uh, that when we recently sent him, uh, that he reminded me recently that we sent him off to a camp when he was around seven years of age to a camp from, we living in Tennessee, and the camp was in Western North Carolina. And uh, we sent him for a week long. It was first sleepover. We went big. We didn't go one night. We went a whole week. And he told me that he cried every night uh, at camp. Uh, tell you me, it was a safe place. That camp has been in our family's history for a long time. Uh, and, and if uh, mom and dad had known when we were going out of the camp's driveway that he was crying, we would have turned around and to come on back and to pick him up. Moms and dads, don't we struggle? Uh, caught between the parenting wisdom of allowing one's child to tough it out uh, and build up that resilience uh, through challenges that uh, they'll face even though we know that they're doing that in a safe environment. Um, or coming to the rescue. I know you who are involved in raising your own children or children of others are walking that tightrope between knowing how much support to give uh, your child, especially when the world seems oh, so, so scary um, when people are walking around wearing these things. And how much do we shelter them and not tell them what's going on? It's a balancing act. Uh, thankfully, because children can be exceedingly self-focused and because of our reassurance, reassurance that everything's going to be fine as we tell our children, uh, it will help our children make it through this time. But for adults, um, reality can be a bit tough. And the reality is that sometimes we are left to endure painful circumstances. Sometimes we uh, find ourselves alone and there's no one to help us uh, we must gut it out ourselves, exercise, grit, toughen up, or collapse. Sometimes we have no idea which way to go, despite all the people giving us well-intentioned uh, advice and well-meaning direction. Sometimes we may feel homeless, no matter how comfortable are our surroundings. I felt that way this week. We were out of uh, power for three days uh, because of the recent storms, and even though we were had shelter over our heads, uh, in a very familiar place or home, it's still without that lights and that security, you felt a little homeless there as we cooked dinner with headlamps. No wonder our hearts are troubled in these days. So as we continue with our practice of being separated, uh, church scattered, uh, maintaining physical distance, even with those who we love, we cannot help but to long for what we might call in John 14, the great homecoming, a, a huge family uh, reunion. Later today, um, on this Mother's Day, my family, I'm the youngest of five siblings, we're going to gather on Zoom with our own children and our grandchildren and we'll have a uh, kind of a, a great kind of reconnect and conversation. Um, and we'll also be celebrating my, my mother's life. Uh, she died late uh, this past fall and uh, thankfully did not have to encounter the loneliness of being in a retirement home by herself in these days of, of the coronavirus. But we're gonna gather um, over on Zoom. We were supposed to be gathering in two weeks in the mountains of North Carolina to inter her ashes and to celebrate her life, but that's not gonna happen. Uh, and so we're gonna try to find a way to connect and connect. I, I do 
miss my mom. I wish um, that, no, I, I mean, I, I, while she's gone, I, I still find myself wanting to, you know, as you know, pick up the phone and to call. There's a rhythm and a comfort in that calling, even though she had memory issues and phone calls were not long, nor were they deep. There was that ritual of just connecting. We want um, to connect. Sense of home, being with family. J Jesus says, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have not told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Wouldn't it be grand, if you think with me this morning, if all the people we love, and especially those who we've lost in this season, showed up on our doorstep unannounced. Imagine that they appeared on a Zoom conference call, and there they were. Would that a respected mentor who caught wind that we were struggling uh, and kind of covering up our sadness despite our best efforts, they found out and they came and showed us the way forward. Um, could not God our Father come and rescue us from this devastation, this isolation, this free-floating fear of what might happen next? Come, Jesus, and take us to that place prepared just for us so that we can join the whole household of God and party together until we're tired and we can retreat into the room of safety and of comfort. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Believe, but help our unbelief. Right now there is grief upon grief as we huddle behind our respective doors and our respective homes, unable to be with those who we ache to see and touch and even to hold. I heard a story coming out of uh, New Orleans uh, the other day that got me thinking and it shows the, the sorrow of the expensive loss of what we're facing right now. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great story coming from the city that has faced so much loss. And uh, they, as you know, have been a hot spot around our nation because of the, um, the COVID cases. And uh, the story goes that the leader of the band, of the, um, the bandaholics, the brassaholics, I should say, the brassaholics, um, heard that uh, the mother of a friend of theirs had died. And in normal circumstances, they would gather the church, they would dress, and with their instruments, they would lead the, the way to bring the departed person home. And he listened to his friend grieving about not being able to have a funeral for his mother, and he, and he said, well, let's get the brassaholics together. And he sent word and told them to put on their best dress, to get their instruments, to go outside of the church and the street, and to start playing and we got to send her home. And so they started playing, I'll fly away. And the people came out. And as they heard it, they started to cry because they understood what was taking place. Jill Duffield is the editor of the Presbyterian Outlook, um, and it, it, let's see if I have yeah I have her magazine subscription right here. And if you are in a position to uh, subscribe to the Presbyterian Outlook, it's a good uh, uh, devotional and informational guide. If you could, uh, they really need your support right now, and so you might consider taking out a subscription to the Presbyterian Outlook. She's also a great. Writer, and in the current issue, uh, she writes, We all want to be brought home. We ache for the embrace of the Father who runs out to meet us, regardless of the mistakes we've made. We long for the love of a mother who refuses to abandon us, no matter what, uh, how it pierces her soul to see us in pain. We yearn for the acceptance of siblings. We want a place of safety and refuge and relief when everything around us seems threatening. And when it seems impossible, we want someone to come and bring us home. And Jesus promises us he will. Jesus tells us to believe. Believe in God. Believe in him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He goes to prepare a place for us. 
a space in the household of God, a room in the mansion of heaven. And while we wait for this great homecoming, the glorious family reunion, we are the holy priesthood, the living stones of spiritual houses right now and right here and now. We are the ones who exercise mercy when conventional wisdom says we should let people tough it out. We are the ones who sing songs of hope in the street. We are the ones who believe in Jesus and who live in hope and ask God for the courage to do the work that Jesus did and does. Nice. We are the ones who know where our home is. And therefore, there is no reason for us to have our hearts troubled nor to be afraid. We are the ones who have the privilege and the responsibility to go with Jesus and bring people home. Amen. As we come to this time of prayer, I invite you to put away anything that is distracting or that interferes with your time to spend time between yourself and God. Let us pray. Holy, comforting Lord, we come to you this morning with a prayer much like others that are being lifted up to you from your children all around the world. We come to you first with adoration for you and for the awesome presence that you are in this world. We bring our thanksgiving for your grace and for the wholeness of life that you give each of us in our own lives. We give thanks for friends and family who are your face of love in the midst of our lives. We especially give thanks for loving mothers, whether by birth or adoption or fostering or by women who nurtured us on our life journeys. On this day of celebration and remembrance, we give you thanks for the influences they had or continue to have in our lives, for the special gifts they have brought to our families. And we come to you in this prayer of the people, once again, asking, asking for health, asking for safety, asking for wisdom. We bring to you those joys and concerns that are on each of our hearts as we silently express them now. And now we come to you with that perfect prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and continues to teach disciples today, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Golden rings and rubies, priceless treasures, rarity still not worth as much as she who loves the Lord faithfully. She brings good, not harm, for her days to come. She works all day, her arms are strong. She provides for the one she loves. Open arms for the ones in need. Rich in love, she's royalty. She's royalty. Wisdom is on her tongue. She's respected by the young. She's blessed. She's fearless. She's honored for the work her hands have done. Clothed with strength and dignity, 
She sees the poor and needy, she stretches out her hands. From a tangled mess, she makes a tapestry. Open arms for the ones in need, rich in love, she's royalty. She's royalty. Wisdom is on her tongue. She's respected by the young. She's blessed. She's fearless. She's honored for the work her hands have done. Clothed with strength and dignity. She sees the poor and needy. She stretches out her hands. From a tangled mess, she makes a tapestry. Open arms for the ones in need. Rich in love, she's royalty. She's royalty. So I hope you will uh, stay on to take part in the Zoom interview I did with Crystal Ripple, uh, the church's orphans. And now uh, hear the prayer of thanksgiving and receive the benediction. Lord Jesus, you have put your life into our hands. Now we put our life into yours. Take us, renew us, and remake us. What we have been is past. What we shall be through you still awaits us. Lead us on. Amen. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Folks, we are on a pilgrimage of hope. Let's walk on. Hey everybody, it's John Hilly, a uh, pastor and head of staff at East Brentwood Presbyterian Church in Middle Tennessee. And I have here um, Crystal Ribble on the line with me in a and I want to talk about a book that she wrote not long ago. Uh, we are meeting and we have a shared experience that we're both displaced from the recent storms here in the mid-state and we're without electricity right now. And before we recorded this, we were commiserating about how long um, we're going to be um, out of power and placing bets on that. Um, but we're, we're here and I want to talk today about a book that she has written called The Church's Orphans, How the Church Can Protect Couples longing for parenthood. And so Crystal, um, thank you so much for joining us today. And what I'm interested in knowing is, tell me about this book and what motivated you to write this book. Sure, well, thanks for having me. Um, this book kind of started a long time ago, just from different life experiences that I had had. Um, I'm a preacher's kid, so I grew up in a pastor's yeah. home. And just by the nature of being a pastor's kid, you can also feel other at times. And so I think that, that feeling that I had as a kid and, and growing into an adult um, made me view other people within the church differently. And so I saw some of their plights and the different things they were going through, through a different lens. And so as I grew up and I started noticing some different groups of people um, and I made friends you know, in my adult life that were going through some very, very hard things, um, the Lord just started to give me a message um, to speak on their behalf. And so specifically, because of where I'm at in life, being a, a young mom with little kids, I have so many friends and people that I've encountered that have gone through infertility and, and that being a part of their story. Um, and so I began to just hear all of these things that had happened within their faith communities and their small groups and church settings that were really hurtful. But I didn't believe that it was they were intentionally, you know, being hurt. It was just kind of, we didn't have the right education on what they were going through. Um, so I just started on a journey to, to talk to a lot of these people and figure out what it was that we as a church could do better, you know, to love them better. 
Mm. Yeah, I love the, the intent of your book, which was to try to really try to understand and welcome those who have been accidentally marginalized. And I like how you're candid of some of our blind spots in the church that we unknowingly, from pastors down to congregational members, who would no more wish to kind of convey what it comes across as conveying, but they're hurtful things that are said to people who are part of the community. And um, the church does have blind spots with, with regard to how we tend to have a sorting and a grouping. I mean, it mirrors what goes on in our society a lot. And we say, you know, for we are all one, but yet we sort. And so I really appreciate you, you naming that and then pursuing the importance of education. So uh, do you want to tell me a little bit more about some of the things that we could take, what advice you might have us so we could improve our own education about how we receive um, brothers and sisters who are, are and seekers? Sure, yeah. You know, specifically in the book, as I'm talking about infertility, I think a lot of the tools that I give are good for any life circumstance, honestly, that you're going through. Um, when I talk about the the beginning of this being education. You know, if you understand what someone is going through better, then I think you approach them in a, in a better manner because un you understand a little bit more about what they're going through. And so specific, specifically with infertility, there's a lot that I think people that haven't walked that journey don't understand. Um, so it's easy to make a statement about something and not realize that you could be saying something very hurtful. So the first is just really educating yourself um, another thing that I touch on in the book is the grief cycle. And I think oftentimes, and again, this goes across any spectrum of things that people are going through. We see the grief cycle as linear, that mm -hmm. we start the grief cycle and then we're going to go through it and we get to the end and everything's fine, but it's called cycle for a reason. And so it is circular and you start this process. And again, we often think that you move through that circle and then you get back to the beginning. And then it'll end there or it'll just keep going. And as I talked to all these couples that were going through, that they were a part of this infertility journey, um, they, they would talk specifically about being on the grief cycle and constantly going around. But even more so than that, it was that sometimes they'd be moving through the grief cycle and they would get to a certain point and then start over again because they would have trauma happen again. Even though another miscarriage, or you have another no, or another thing of bad news, and that happens with all of us, you know, as you're going through life, if you, if you lose a parent, or, or you've lost a job, or something has happened with your children, or whatever it is, um, a lot of times we don't move through the grief cycle in a way that's like textbook, so understanding that, and knowing that someone might be darting around on that grief cycle a little bit as you're approaching them, um, I think it really changes your rhetoric and things that you might say to them if you knew where they were. Um, I also talk about creating safe spaces. And so I specifically dive into like congregations and pastors kind of structuring their church in a way where, you know, the, the pastor is bearing so much of the weight of counseling. And, and it's one of the beautiful things about a shepherd and his congregants, right? That they can come to you um, when they're hurting. But at the same time, you do not always have the training for every single thing that someone's going through in their life. And so that can end up being hurtful if someone comes to their pastor or comes to someone in their church um, that needs counseling, but they're not necessarily getting what, what they need. And so there's a way that, that a pastor and church leaders can structure their church where if you know other people that have walked this journey, whatever that journey may be, before someone else you can pair them up and, um, and help them be able to, to navigate those waters together, you know? So I kind of, I kind of explore a bunch of those different things and give you essentially tools, um, to approach them better. Yeah. I liked how some of the tools that you mentioned in the book and, and, and I like just, just getting it out there that pastors don't have to have all the answers and that's incredibly freeing. Um, we um, oftentimes feel like we do and then and that it also what you mentioned and underscore is the empowering of others who have that experience uh, who have those gifts and very empowering to them for them to walk alongside as um, as people walk through through grief and and I especially like that it's not a linear track and it 
and and just when you and and it can enter you can enter at many different points of of the grief process, uh, and uh, and I and I like that. And so, uh, what else do you want to talk about? Uh, how, what you've learned from other you know, you know couples who are facing infertility uh, about what it's like to walk with them. Is there anything sure. that comes to your mind that you'd be like to share? Yeah. I think one of the biggest things was how often they felt different within different church settings, different group settings, even within their families or their friend groups, that just because they were walking through something where they could not conceive a child, whatever, at whatever point they were at in that journey, um, they would be treated differently. And if someone else was celebrating something, um, like a baby shower, then this particular person would maybe not be invited or, um, or would be treated differently at the baby shower because, oh, she must not be able to understand this or to go through this. Or, you know, so I, I give examples in the book of, you know, these everyday heroes, really, these, these warriors that are going through all of these circumstances um, to kind of show examples of what's happened. Um, and the biggest thing that kept coming back around is that they didn't want to be treated differently because it's, it's not something to be treated different about. You know, it just happens to be something they're walking through. We all have some sort of hard road that we've gone through in life, or if we haven't yet, we will at some point. And, you know, to be, to be treated differently in certain social settings was just really hard, you know? Yeah, I really like, um, I, it calls to mind the passage in John 14, I will not leave you orphaned. And I like how you write, we may not think that we are pushing people away or bearing them in shame, but oftentimes when someone is walking a road for which the church doesn't have a clear map, we orphan them. We orphan them because of our fear of the unknown. And I think kind of, we're not, not quite sure what to do when we can't back to the grouping uh, that, uh, and we have to be careful here, you know, with our own work here in uh, our community, which has a lot of young families, mm -hmm. is that we do not, you know, lift them up as the standard and then at the exclusion of feeling and, and accentuating a feeling of different on the part of those uh, couples who may not have children um, uh, because of infertility or because they're just not there yet or it's not part of their plan right now. So I, I really like how you have mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, I, that's one of my favorite lines too, you know, I'm, as a mom to an orphaned child, you know, my old, my oldest son is orphaned, um, it gave me such a different lens in, into this sometimes, and that we, what happened to him in real life is something that we also do to people, but unknowingly, you know, and we, I think it's, I, I talk in the book about moving closer to people, and I use like the the unity of the spirit as an example of this and, and what the church really should be. Um, and I think when we don't understand something, we're so afraid to move close to it um, because we don't know what's there. You know, we don't, we don't know what it's like. We don't know what it's going to cost us if we move too close. And I think as believers, um, we need to understand that that's what Jesus did. You know, he, he moved to, to people um, that were in the margins. And that's where, that's where he lived. You know, he moved to those edges that we don't always understand. Um, and so I think if we're going to emulate him, that's one thing we have to do, you know, to be able to understand empathy and to understand how to create unity within our churches is that we, we need to move closer to people. Um, so. And I think the first action of empathy is to listen. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, well, this, um, thank you for that. And so this, we're going to incorporate this uh, table as part of our table of content for um, a Sunday in which it happens to be Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about celebrating mm -hmm. and uh, um, tell me, uh, how do we, uh, knowing that in our room or listening as we're all online right now in this time of COVID, is that people come with different life experiences and everyone has faced trauma. And so how, for some, this is a day of celebration. For others, this is not. It's just an underscoring of, of, of a grief cycle they're going through or a reminder of a previous time, which was very sad for them. Mm -hmm. So what, um, 
what, what would you say about how do we appropriately celebrate uh, and, and also to acknowledge the gifts of other people that they bring to the community? Um, is there anything that comes to mind for you on that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's really a large spectrum of that. You know, when we talk about Jesus saying that he is the life, you know, he, he is wanting us to celebrate our life. He is the life. He is giving you life. And I think oftentimes when we go through something that's really difficult in life, we can just be so focused and so bogged down on this thing that is so hurtful that we can forget to celebrate our own life. And there's so many ways in which a congregation can surround someone and support things that will help them celebrate their life. And what I mean by that are um, everyone has different giftings, you know, that are very We're recording this while we're without um, power supply from our own homes. So here we go. Crystal, I lost you for just a moment and I okay. feel the, 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 uh, the silence, but back to you and we'll wrap it up. Okay, so well, some of the things that I think you can do as far as like celebrating is people within your congregation, if they have different um, giftings that you notice and that you see that are very giving to your congregation, very giving to the kingdom. Um, highlight those things and, and give them opportunities to serve in, in those ways. Um, show them how much life they are giving by doing those things. And I think it will also, you know, contribute to how they feel. The other thing is for people that are longing to be moms, you know, mothers are nurturers, they are givers, they are care, they're caretakers. And there are ways that women that long to be moms do that naturally. You know, maybe you're a middle school, Sunday school teacher or something like that. And there are students that rely on you that feel like they can confide in you maybe before they would their own mother. You know, there, there are ways that you are mothering. And if you can point that out to people and show them that like, you are a mother, you know, a mother is a nurturer, a mother is a lover, a mother is a caretaker. Like you are doing those things for the body of Christ. Then I think it helps move them from just looking at what they think are ashes and maybe they are, but to celebrating you know, instead of just dwelling on those things. And so making Mother's Day more of just a celebration of what a mother is to someone, you know, um, instead of just being able to physically produce life from your body, um, mm -hmm. I think makes a world of a difference. Well said. We'll, we'll end with that. And thank you so much for joining uh, me in this table of content as we uh, take care of this issue. Again, it's Crystal Ripple. Uh, her book is The Church's Orphans how the church can protect couples longing for parenthood. Uh, we're scrolling here and you'll be able to see um, where you can get this resource that talks about education and some of the tools that she has discovered that she shares. Also an illumination of the grief process that couples go through during this time of trauma, as well as some celebrations. Crystal, it's been a pleasure to have you today and go to www.crystalribble.com and uh, Happy Mother's Day to you, and may you weather the, the time of the power outage, and um, God bless you, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you.